So just, just to say it again uh, uh, in a slightly different way, um, one, one of the things one can do with empirical research is to ask the question of what sorts of motivations and preferences do human beings in fact have. And one, I take it, long-standing um, worry uh, that people have had, and I've even heard it expressed at this conference, is that without religion, um, people would behave in an entirely uh, selfish way. They would behave uncooperatively uh, when, when it is to their advantage uh, to do so. And this, of course, raises the question of um, what sorts of preferences, motivations uh, do people uh, uh, actually have? And in fact, there's a substantial amount of, uh, of um, evidence coming out of uh, uh, the, the kinds of experimental games that are uh, investigate, investigated in uh, experimental economics uh, that people do have uh, non-self-interested preferences. So for example, uh, people cooperate even in one-shot games um, when uh, defection is the dominant strategy. Um, even when the uh, self-interested thing to do would be to defect, even when you don't, it's not a repeated game, so you don't get the kind of repeated effects, um, the, 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 the kinds of effects on reputa reputation, reciprocal altruism, et cetera, that would be uh, present if you had a, a repeated game. They cooperate uh, even under conditions of anonymity, uh, et cetera. I think it's a really interesting uh, empirical question what the structure of the preferences are that uh, account for this behavior. And I think it's something that we don't understand very well uh, at this point. And I would also, relatedly, what the, what the underlying neural mechanisms are. But that the behavior itself is not um, entirely self-interested seems to be, um, uh, to me, um, the, 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 the empirical uh, evidence seems to be really clear. And, and uh, just to mention one piece of work uh, of, of a more neurobiological sort um, uh, in this context, um, Rilling and others uh, recently did the following. They uh, imaged um, uh, human subjects in a sequential prisoner's dilemma. That is, the first player moves, and then the first player moves first, and the second player knows what the first player's move is. Okay, so um, certainly if people are entirely self-interested, the dominant strategy um, is to defect. Um, in um, imaging uh, uh, investigations, you see when the, when the uh, first player moves cooperatively and you image the second player, uh, uh, you see, and the second player also cooperates, uh, you see um, uh, activation in standard reward areas of the brain, like the dorsal striatum. And interestingly, you get more activation when the player is playing with a human partner than, with the, than when the player is playing with a computer, even though the reward is the same in both cases. And what this seems to strongly suggest is that people are, so to speak, getting independent utility from the fact that they're cooperating with another human being. And I think this is uh, encouraging news. So uh, to the extent that people, this, is, this should be non-self-interested preference, preferences, to the extent that people have non-self-interested preferences, we need to understand better what the structure of these preferences are. Uh, to what extent are people unconditional or altruists? To what extent are they conditional cooperators? And if they are conditional cooperators, uh, what sort of conditional cooperators are they? It may make a great deal of difference it, whether they're the kind of conditional cooperator who um, begins with the assumption that the other player is going to defect and only plays cooperatively if one has reason to believe that the other player is going to play cooperatively too. That would be one possibility. Another possibility is that we're wired up in such a way that, at least in a lot of cases, we think the default strategy is to cooperate. And we only stop cooperating if we see the other person uh, is not cooperating. So the structure of these preferences, I think, is really quite crucial to understanding, um, get, getting a sort of a realistic understanding of the motivational uh, kind of bases that, that we have. And, and, and that, in turn, uh, I think is really our, our best hope for devising moral and political theories that are actually workable and rest on uh, realistic assumptions about human behavior. Um, in addition to these, the general questions of what kinds of preferences do we have, there are very interesting questions about the conditions that elicit uh, the preferences. There's very interesting questions about the distribution of, of the preferences across the population. Obviously, people are not all the same. Some people are more self-interested than others. Uh, all of these are things are uh, all this is information that is, I think, um, highly relevant to um, 
moral and political decision making. And um, uh, there's really beginning to be a very uh, rich body of, uh, uh, of research about it. Now, whenever one talks about the uh, possible relevance of empirical information to uh, moral and political theorizing, um, well, of course, the question that's always raised is, what about the yawning gap between is and ought? Uh, you can't derive uh, an ought from an is. And I'm certainly not claiming, for example, that we can decide whether uh, uh, abortion is moral or immoral by doing an experiment of some kind. But as I've already, I think, somewhat illustrated, uh, empirical information can be relevant to moral decision making in other ways. Uh, it can provide information about what the motivational constraints are. You don't want your moral and political theory to rest on assumptions about the motivations that people have, uh, where those, where those uh, assumptions are just empirically false. Uh, empirical information uh, about the experience of those who live with a moral practice and its consequences uh, can be certainly highly relevant to moral decision making. Uh, we talked uh, very briefly about torture um, uh, in this connection yesterday. Um, abolition, the, the abolitionist movement is uh, highly uh, I think instructive in this connection too. Uh, yesterday, uh, Susan uh, uh, Neiman challenged us to say, well, uh, what is it that's actually empirically learned when um, uh, it was decided that uh, slavery is a bad thing? Well, if you look at the history of the abolitionist movement, lots of things were empirically learned. Uh, for example, one of the things that was decisive, as I understand it, in uh, persuading the uh, British uh, government and the British public to um, uh, and uh, British involvement in the slave trade was simply empirical information about the kinds of conditions under which slaves were being uh, transported and the enormously high uh, death rates, uh, et cetera, the incredibly uh, cramped and filthy conditions, et cetera. So I think that um, uh, moral decision making, when it's uh, uh, good moral decision making, is going to be uh, informed at every point with um, uh, empirical information. Now, finally, um, there's been some talk at this conference about the idea of putting morality on a rational foundation. And I think this is a great idea if all that it means is that you want a secular, not naturalistic, non-religious uh, story about where morality comes from. But I'm afraid that uh, at least sometimes this is understood or construed in a much narrower way. That is, one, the assumption is that we should think of morality as grounded in reason with a capital R where this is narrowly construed as in opposition to emotion, affect, um, uh, et cetera. And of course, there's a very long-standing philosophical uh, tradition of thinking about the origins of morality in this way. Um, Kant uh, uh, it, and, and I suppose Hobbes in some ways would be uh, major figures in this uh, uh, tradition. And uh, I think that this idea of, of putting morality on a rational basis in this uh, narrower sense is um, it's an idea about which I'm pretty skeptical. Uh, I think one of the lessons of recent empirical work is that conscious rational deliberation and rule following is much less central to uh, morality and moral decision making and having a good moral character, et cetera, uh, than many have, have supposed. Instead, things like affect, implicit learning, automatic processing um, are extremely uh, important. We saw this illustrated in the talk we had yesterday about uh, 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 racial and gender prejudice. Um, and I think this is not just an abstract philosophical point, but it bears on the uh, whole question of how we are to address uh, people who uh, uh, hold uh, beliefs or even moral beliefs that we think are misguided in some way. Uh, I think the strategy of trying to change their minds by carefully to explaining to them how stupid and misguided and irrational they are um, is uh, unlikely to be uh, effective if just employed by itself. It's an overly rationalistic strategy. And uh, with that, I'll end my talk. Thank you.